Hello and welcome to this first movie in this advanced tutorial series on Poser 10 and Poser Pro 2014 by Renderosity. I'm Mark Bremer and we'll be exploring these nooks and crannies with you as we get into some of the more advanced functions that Poser has to offer. I am making several assumptions if you're sitting here watching this movie. The first one is that you already are familiar with Poser. You have built scenes, you're used to working with characters, putting lights in scenes, modifying those lights, things like that. So you've got a relatively good working knowledge of how to make all the parts fit together. The second assumption is that you've kind of maybe hit a plateau and you're looking at taking your skills to the next level. It's no longer about lighting an object or lighting a person. It's about creating an environment, a mood, or telling a story. And it gets a little more complex as you do that just because of the additional visual requirements but it also gets a little more complex when you start engaging some of the more advanced features that this program has, especially when it comes to rendering. As we progress through the series, we'll also be looking at ways to customize characters by building your own morphs, your own morph targets, and things like if you're so inclined, putting together packages you could even sell, I suppose, at Renderosity. But more importantly, that you have got a ever-increasing arsenal of abilities to go ahead and make some really fantastic imagery because I'll tell you what, Poser is such a great program and can do so much so well and once you start seeing uh, you know behind the curtain what can go on your renderings will just improve so quickly it'll be great. Well let me tell you what we're looking at here and what this first movie is about. This is about auditing complex props and scene elements that you might bring in to start building the background for a larger story. So maybe we've got a superhero running across the roof. Maybe we're going to have some character that uh, is sad. Maybe the clouds are foreboding. Maybe it's just uh, a rain shower for a summer day. There's all sorts of ways we could take an image like this and I've just set up a real basic one to get us going on how to begin thinking about integrating light some of the textures and elements that are part of this pre-built scene and this one happens to be by Dreamland Models. He does some fantastic stuff and this is City Block 8. So if you've got this you can go ahead and play with something really similar. So let's get into the business of auditing the scene and how it relates to considerations when we work with some of these more complex types of textures we have to work with. Let's pop over to the preview window and this scene is very elemental. It's very basic in terms of how I have constructed the lighting. I simply have two lights in the scene. A fill light that is illuminating the left side of the tank and some of the back areas here and a very very strong light, light number two here. If I had more I would name them so we could recognize them. But light two is my sunlight. I want it like the sun is coming through these, these clouds and it's very bright but it's kind of diffuse. We can see too that I've got these little jaggy shadows that are going on here. I've engaged a little bit of blurring on the shadows and if we pop back to the render real quickly I also engage the indirect lighting function so that as light hits one thing it will reflect back and also illuminate objects. We'll take a look at where to find that in just a second and some considerations for that. But now let me explain about getting into scenes and pre-built sets like this to do some object and texture auditing that will better guide you in terms of setting up the render settings so that you don't sit there waiting or rendering overnight to get something that's satisfactory. I know I'm rendering kind of small here but uh, believe me I've got some big renders that I do professionally. Let's hop into the preview window here and let's just click on an object like well this building. Let's go audit the materials for this and talk about the implications that some of these materials may have. The first material we see pop up and if you're unfamiliar with how these objects are constructed they are built and then certain areas are designated as texture maps or texture locations. It's all part of a UV map that gets built in there. You can actually see what they are if we would engage the group editor. Now I'm not going to do this because they're all built. I'm not going to change a single one we'll deal with the group editor later on as we find some other ways to use that. So this is a fairly basic texture right here. It's just a sign. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm interested in things that have a high degree of bump maps or texture maps that go into the specularity channel and the diffuse channel and things like that. So let's hunt something down like that. If we say for example walls is probably a great candidate for that. 
and here we go we've got some texture maps it looks like this one right here is plugging into both the diffuse color which is you would consider it the actual color of the object but it's also in the specular channel so the dark areas here don't reflect anything really and the lighter areas do we also have a texture map and image map it's being indicated here plugging into the bump channel now the bump is at a value right here of 0.1 this is a clue when I start looking at content that I would import how significant this number is if it's at 0.1 or below I don't consider the bump maps to be an issue but sometimes some of the ways that these assets are built the bump value is cranked up pretty high for a normal render not a big deal and by normal I mean something that doesn't involve image based lighting or indirect lighting indirect lighting just uh, falls over and dies and takes a long time when you start getting highly complex texture maps into the bump channel and it just takes longer to process them the other thing with a complex or an over exaggerated value in the bump channel is that the bump map just pays attention to black through white and it has 256 levels of gray that means that if you get a camera close to a wall that has a bump map in it you'll start to see some of those details that in and out detail becoming pixelated let's see if this is the same map sure looks like it to me so we've got a basic grayscale map well now that I just slammed bump maps what are ways you can approach doing something else to get just as much if not more detail but not take a hit in the render area when you start rendering your files out well poser has a fantastic function that seems to be mislabeled if you ask me in here and that is normal maps if we go down the surface selection list right here you'll never find anything that says normal normal maps in posers world are considered gradient bump maps a normal map is an RGB map as opposed to a gray map that you go ahead and plug in here and what it does is it tells Poser to reevaluate the surface that's being considered to have detail. When I say reevaluate, what Poser does is consider two things. First is the normal maps on the building right here, so the walls are really flat. They're just polygons, there's no dimension to them, and we fake it with a bump map so what the bump map does is the poser ray the light ray comes in it hits the wall and then it goes okay the walls flat and then it goes oh no the walls not flat it's got some detail the bump channel and then it proceeds to go ahead and add shadows or create more light or whatever it needs to do based on the values in the bump channel white meaning the highest black meaning the lowest well, why does a normal map take less time to render well if you've got a normal map in place you typically don't even need to have a bump map and it tells the program that when it encounters the flat wall that it changes the normals the actual direction so not all the normals or arrows if you were to think of a, a normal arrow coming perpendicularly out from the wall it fakes it and says no it's a rough surface and that actually accelerates much more rapidly if you're rendering it you can also have a significantly higher level of detail when you do that well how do you you know get normal maps in here especially if it only has a bump map there are ways you can go ahead and extract textures out or replace them with textures if you want of your own and there are some fantastic tools out there that generate normal maps off of black and white grayscale images so I'll do that a number of times and I won't get into that right here we'll do that in an upcoming movie where we get into more details for building outdoor scenes but again for this area right here concerning bumps if I see high values here that's a warning sign because when we go ahead and engage indirect lighting you take a penalty for that well let's take a look at the render area here so as I talk about some of these things it's starting to make sense in a little more real way here we'll come to render settings and we get our modal window that pops up right here now as you know there's two things that you can approach for the Firefly the high-end render of Poser and that is manual settings which it always defaults to or you have auto settings auto settings are the easiest you just kinda drag this thing around and it disengages and re-engages feature sets as you pull it around if you come back to manual settings you can import those automatic settings if you want to but here's where indirect lighting is it's not on by default and in fact if we went ahead and pulled this all the way over 
to the highest quality settings here. Come back to manual settings and we say acquire. Let's see if that automatically checks. It does not. So if you would like to have more believable lighting where there is, say, if you had a, a flat plane and a ball sitting on it and light would hit the plane and then bounce up and illuminate much more softly the underside of the ball, then you can check indirect lighting. With this on, if there are a bazillion texture maps, which there are in this scene, you can expect a slowdown in the render whenever indirect lighting is on. Additionally, you can keep pumping up the quality. If you start uh, going way up in the quality right here, you will pay a penalty for it in terms of render time, but it's usually worth it. Also, you can control how many samples, that is little light rays basically, just cascade across the surface to give that information to the final renderer. So as we're working with, let me go ahead and close this right now, bump maps, we have the ability to tell the poser render engine with a precise amount of detail how much we want it to pay attention to areas like this. Well, let's go back into the pose room here and find something else. I'm going to jump into my posing camera real quick. Select another building here, or if I've got a rooftop, Let's highlight this and go back into the materials room. Now I selected this because the modeling camera is a little more close to that and I want to go see real quick what we've got going on. There is no gradient bump taking place right here and there's no bump map at all. So since I've also slammed bump maps and uh, we've gone well, what? Uh, how can how can we cheat that? How can we not get that speed hit for bumps, especially when there's noise on a roof like this. And let's come back to the render room, go to the pose, and then pop into the render. Right now it's just a flat gray. And that, if you're going for realism, isn't particularly real. There's always variations in where light bounces and things like that. Your first instinct may be to go ahead and put in a noise channel or something like that when you're working with a bump map that's a speed kill and if you are viewing a lot of the roofs because of your camera position or if you've got just a generic street texture and you're trying to, to make it more pronounced more easily seen increasing the bump channel will only leave you dissatisfied how do we fix that with this selected again let me pop into the materials room there's several ways to do that without adding a bump one is, in terms of the specular value, we can see right now it's all constant. I don't want to add a bump, but I want to make the light break up a little bit so it's not quite so obvious of what's going on. And this happens to be a power box. Let's track down the roof here. There we go. Let's see what we've got going on. Oh, see, there's a bump map. Helps if you select the right texture, doesn't it? Okay, well, let's see what this bump, in fact, looks like. It's a lot of noise. So what I personally like to do, since I didn't see a whole lot of benefit in that render in terms of detail that's popping up, is to take maps like this and actually plug them into the specular value. This allows the light, let me go ahead and come up here and collapse this one so we can see the connection better, this light and dark area. Currently the specular color for the roof right here is pure black. I want it to actually have a little greater value and it's picking up that texture from this texture map which is the same thing. What I would like to do is where it's light here, I would also like the value to be light. So the color and the specular value, how bright it is, is going to be more pronounced now. I could if I wanted, and this is a lower bump map value right here, it's 0 0.01 instead of 0 0.1 like the bricks were. So this is a more subtle texture. However, this is where I would uh, very strongly consider going ahead and grabbing this texture, running to a normal map program and creating a normal map and plugging it into the gradient bump and dumping the bump channel altogether. Instead, feeding this information and we could take that from this color channel too and just drop it in there since these maps are the same. So there's some ways to begin approaching items like that. Other things to consider in your pose is, uh, or in your scene, is are you going to have light going through glass? The transparency, whenever light goes through that, if you're using indirect light, it's going to take more time. Anytime there's transparencies, 
especially with uh, oh you've probably already experienced it with the characters if you have a modeled beer on, beard on the character or modeled hair and you go to indirect lighting and all of a sudden it takes an eternity as it starts processing through the character's hair and that's because texture maps vastly reduce the computational time for the program so if I'm inside a warehouse or I've got lights inside the house that are shining out of it and I start doing soft shadows along with uh, indirect lighting you can simply expect longer and longer render times. So as I look at the scene and as I jump back to my modeling camera right here are any of these things going to take place and how can I improve the scene? The water tank's pretty nice. If I pop over to the render right here yeah, yeah it's looking okay. I've popped into that texture actually and it has displacement maps to create these slats on the side. It's a simple sphere. Now displacements being used instead of normal maps, um, a normal map's a faster way to do that. So just know that's there. Look at this light right here. I don't suppose normally the, the designer of the Dreamland models assume people would be flying around the power lines with the cameras, but this is a very low resolution mesh right here and we can see it in fact kind of planing out. There might be some ways that we could smooth that a little bit more or add some texture to it to disguise this a little bit better. And that is also something we can accomplish with a bump map or a normal map. So as I become a little more satisfied with where the camera is, as I start playing with lighting, it's all these things that work into the consideration of storytelling. Okay, I want to have cast shadows where you really pick up the detail of the object. I'm going to have some some lights inside glass. What do I need to do for that? And begin thinking about your scene that way and just making or getting yourself set up to make some intelligent choices as we start approaching where the camera sits, how we modify textures, and how we start applying that in the render room. In our next movie, we'll go ahead and take a look, a very detailed look, at the considerations of setting up an outside scene and engaging some of the very things I've spoken about in this movie.